By 8 o'clock the light was failing. The loudspeakers in the tower of the Stoke Poges clubhouse began, in a more than human tenor, to announce the closing of the courses. Lenina and Henry abandoned their game and walked back towards the club. From the grounds of the internal and external secretion trust came the lowing of those thousands of cattle which provided, with their hormones and their milk, the raw materials for the great factory at Farnham Royal. An incessant buzzing of helicopters filled the twilight. Every two and a half minutes, a bell and the screech of whistles announced the departure of one of the light monorail trains which carried the lower caste golfers back from their separate course to the metropolis. Lenina and Henry climbed into their machine and started off. At 800 feet, Henry slowed down the helicopter screws and they hung for a minute or two poised above the fading landscape. The forest of Burnham beaches stretched like a great pool of darkness towards the bright shore of the western sky. Crimson at the horizon, the last of the sunset faded through orange, upwards into yellow and a pale watery green. Northwards, beyond and above the trees, the internal and external secretions factory glared with a fierce electric brilliance from every window of its twenty stories. Beneath them lay the buildings of the golf club, the huge lower caste barracks, and, on the other side of a dividing wall, the smaller houses reserved for Alpha and Beta members. The approaches to the monorail station were black and the, with the ant-like pollution of lower caste activity. From under the glass vault, a lighted train shot out into the open. Following its southeasterly course across the dark plain, their eyes were drawn to the majestic buildings of the, of the Slough Crematorium. For the safety of night-flying planes, its, fall, its four tall chimneys were floodlighted and tipped with crimson danger signals. It was a landmark. Why do the smokestacks have those things like balconies around them? inquired Lenina. Phosphorus recovery, explained Henry telegraphically. On their way up the chimney, the gases go through four separate treatments. He 205 used to go right out of circulation every time they cremated someone. Now they recover over 98% of it, more than a kilo and a half per adult corpse, which makes the best part of 400 tons of phosphorus every year from England alone. Henry spoke of a happy pride, rejoicing wholeheartedly in the achievement, as though it had been his own. Fine to think we can go on being socially useful even after we're dead, making plants grow. Benina, meanwhile, had turned her eyes away and was looking perpendicularly downwards at the monorail station. Fine, she agreed, but queer that alphas and betas won't make any more plants grow than those nasty little gammas and deltas and epsilons down there. All men are physico-chemically equal, said Henry sententiously. Besides, even Epsilons perform indispensable services. Even an Epsilon. Lenina suddenly remembered an occasion when, as a little girl at school, she had woken up in the middle of the night and become aware, for the first time, of the whispering that had haunted all her sleeps. She saw again the beam of moonlight, the row of small white beds, heard once more the soft, soft voice that said, the words were there, unforgotten, unforgettable after so many night-long repetitions. Everyone works for everyone else. We can't do without anyone. Even Epsilons are useful. We, would, we couldn't do without Epsilons. Everyone works for everyone else. We can't do without anyone. Lenina remembered her first shock of fear and surprise, her speculations through half a wakeful hour, and then, under the influence of those endless repetitions, the gradual soothing of her mind, the soothing, the smoothing, the stealthy creeping of sleep. I suppose Epsilons don't really mind being Epsilons, she said aloud. Of course they don't. How can they? They don't know what it's like being anything else. We'd mind, of course. But then we've been differently conditioned. Besides, we start with a different heredity. I'm glad I'm not an Epsilon, said Lenina, with conviction. And if you were an Epsilon, said Henry, your conditioning would have made you no less thankful that you weren't a Beta or an Alpha. He put his forward propeller into gear and headed the machine towards London. Behind them, in the west, the crimson and orange were almost faded. A dark bank of cloud had crept into the zenith. As they flew over the crematorium, the plane shot upwards on the column of hot air rising from the chimneys, only to fall as suddenly when it passed into the descending chill beyond. What a marvellous switchback! Lenina laughed delightedly. But Henry's tone was almost, for a moment, melancholy. Do you know what that switchback was? He said. It was some human being finally and definitely disappearing, going up in a squirt of hot gas. It would be curious to know who it was, a man or a woman, an alpha or an epsilon. He sighed. Then, in a resolutely cheerful voice, Anyhow, he concluded, there's one thing we can be certain of. Whoever he may have been, he was happy when he was alive. Everybody's happy now. Yes, everybody's happy now, echoed Lenina. They had heard the words repeated 150 times every night for 12 years. 
Landing on the rest on the roof of Henry's 40-story apartment house in Westminster, they went straight down to the dining hall. There, in a loud and cheerful company, they ate an excellent meal. Soma was served with the coffee. Lenina took two half-gram tablets and Henry free. At twenty past nine, they walked across the street to the newly opened Westminster Abbey Cabaret. It was a night almost about clouds, moonless and starry, but of this on the whole depressing fact, Lenina and Henry were fortunately unaware. The electric sky signs effectively shut off the outer darkness. Calvin Stopes and his sixteen saxophonists. From the facade of the new abbey, the giant letters invitingly glared. London's finest scent and colour organ. All the latest synthetic music. They entered. The air seemed hot and somehow breathless with the scent of ambergris and sandalwood. On the domed ceiling of the hall, the colour organ had momentarily painted a tropical sunset. The sixteen saxophonists are playing an old favourite. There ain't no bottle in all the world like that dear little bottle of mine. Four hundred couples were five stepping round the polished floor. Lenina and Henry were soon the four hundred and first. The saxophones wailed like melodious cats under the moon, moaned in the alto antenna registers as though the little deaf were upon them. Rich with a wealth of harmonics, their tremulous chorus mounted towards a climax, louder and ever louder, until at last, with a wave of his hand, the conductor let loose the final shattering note of ether music and blew the sixteen merely human blowers clean out of existence. Thunder in A-flat major. And then, in all but silence, in all but darkness, there followed a gradual deturgescence, a diminuendo sliding gradually through quarter tones, down, down to a faintly whispered dominant chord that lingered on, while the 5-4 while, while rhythm still pulsed below, charging the darkened seconds with an intense expectancy, and at last expectancy was fulfilled. There was a sudden explosive sunrise, and simultaneously, the sixteen burst into song. Bottle of mine, it's you I've always wanted. Bottle of mine, why was I ever decanted? Skies are blue inside of you, the weather's always fine, for there ain't no bottle in the world like that dear little bottle of mine. Five stepping of the other four hundred round and round Westminster Abbey, Lenina and Henry were yet dancing in another world. The worm, the warm, the richly coloured, the infinitely friendly world of Soma Holiday. How kind, how good looking, how delightfully amusing everyone was. Bottle of mine, it's you I've always wanted. But Lenina and Henry had what they wanted. They were inside, here and now, safely inside with the fine weather, the perennially blue sky. And when, exhausted, the sixteen had laid by their saxophones and the synthetic music apparatus was producing the very latest in slow Malfusian blues, they might have been twin embryos gently rocking together on the waves of a bottled ocean of blood surrogate. Good night, dear friends. Good night, dear friends. The loudspeakers veiled their commands in a genial and musical politeness. Good night, dear friends. Obediently, with all the others, Lenina and Henry left the building. The depressing stars had travelled quite some way across the heavens. But, though the separating screen of the sky signs had now to a great extent dissolved, the two young people still retained their happy ignorance of the night. Swallowing half an hour before closing time, that second dose of Soma had raised quite an impenetrable wall between the actual universe and their minds. Bottled, they crossed the street. Bottled, they took the lift up to Henry's room on the 28th floor. And yet, bottled as she was, and in spite of that second gram of Soma, Lelina did not forget to take all the contraceptive precautions prescribed by the regulations. Years of intensive hypnopedia, and from 12 to 17, Malfusian drill three times a week had made the taking of these precautions almost as automatic and inevitable as blinking. Oh, and that reminds me, she said, as she came back from the bathroom. Fanny Crown wants to know where you found that lovely green Morocco surrogate cartridge belt you gave me. Alternate Thursdays were Bernard's Solidarity Service Days. After an early dinner at the Afro Diteum, to which Helmholtz had recently been elected under Rule 2, he took leave of his friend and, hailing a taxi on the roof, told the man to fly to the Fordson Community Singery. The machine rose a couple of hundred metres, then headed eastwards, and as it turned, there before Bernard's eyes, gigantically beautiful, was the Singery. Floodlighted, its 320 metres of white Carrara surrogate gleamed with a snowy incandescence over Ludgate Hall. At each of the four corners of a telecopter platform, an immense tea shone crimson against the night, and from the mouths of 24 vast golden trumpets rumbled a solemn synthetic music. Damn, I'm late, Bernard said to himself as he first caught sight of Big Henry, the singery clock. And sure enough, as he was paying off his cab, Big Henry sounded the hour. Ford sang out an immense ba bass voice from all the golden trumpets. Ford, Ford, Ford. Nine times, Bernard ran for the lift. 
The great auditorium for Ford's Day celebrations and other massed community sings was at the bottom of the building. Above it, a hundred to each floor, were the 7,000 rooms used by, the, by solidarity groups for their fortnight services. Bernard dropped down to floor 33, hurried along the corridor, stood hesitating for a moment outside room 3210, then, having wound himself up, opened the door and walked in. Thank Ford, he was not the last. Three chairs of the twelve arranged round the circular table were still unoccupied. He slipped into the nearest of them as inconspicuous, inconspicuously as he could, and prepared to frown at the yet later comers whenever they should arrive. Turning towards him, what were you playing this afternoon? The girl on his left inquired. Obstacle or electromagnetic? Bernard looked at her. Ford, it was Morgana Rothschild, and blushingly had to admit that he had been playing neither. Morgana stared at him with astonishment. There was an awkward silence. Then pointedly she turned away and addressed herself to the more sporting man on her left. A good beginning for a solidarity service, thought Bernard miserably and foresaw for himself yet another failure to achieve atonement. If only he had given himself time to look around instead of scuttling for the nearest chair, he could have sat between Fifi Bradlaugh and Joanna Diesel, instead of which he had gone and blindly planted himself next to Morgana. Morgana! Ford! Those black eyebrows of hers, that eyebrow rather, for they met above the nose. Ford, and on his right was Clara de Terding. True, Clara's eyebrows didn't meet, but she was really too pneumatic, whereas Fifi and Joanna were absolutely right. Plump, blonde, not too large, and it was that great lout, Tom Kawaguchi, who now took the seat between them. The last arrival was Saragini Engels. You're late, said the president of the group severely. Don't let it happen again. Saragini apologized and slid into her place between Jim Bokanovsky and Herbert Akunin. The group is now complete. The solidarity circle perfect and without flaw. Man, woman, man, in a ring of endless alternation round the table. Twelve of them ready to be made one, waiting to come together, to be fused, to lose their twelve separate identities in a larger being. The president stood up, made the sign of the T, and, switching on the synthetic music, let loose the soft, indefatigable beating of drums and a choir of instruments. Near wind and superstring, that plangently repeated and repeated the brief and unescapably haunting melody of the first solidarity hymn. Again, again, and it was not the ear that heard the pulsing rhythm, it was the midriff, the wail and clang of those recurring harmonies, haunted, not the mind, but the yearning bowels of compassion. The president made another sign of the tea and sat down. The service had begun. The dedicated soma tablets were placed in the centre of the table. The loving cup of strawberry ice cream soma was passed from hand to hand and, with the formula, I drink to my annihilation, twelve times quaffed. Then to the accompaniment of the synthetic orchestra, the first of the solidarity hymn was sung. Ford, we are twelve, oh, make us one, like drops within the social river, oh, make us now together run, as swiftly as thy shining fliver. Twelve yearning stanzas, and then the loving cup was passed a second time. I drink to the greater being, is now the formula. All drank. Tirelessly the music played. The drums beat. The crying and clashing of the harmonies were an obsession in the melted bowels. The second solidarity hymn was sung. Come, greater being, social friend, annihilating twelve in one. We long to die, for when we end, our larger life has but begun. Again twelve stanzas. By this time the soma had begun to work. Eyes shone, cheeks were flushed, the inner light of universal benevolence broke out on every face in happy, friendly smiles. Even Bernard felt himself a little melted. When Morgana Rothschild turned and beamed at him, he did his best to beam back. But the eyebrow, that black two-in-one, alas, it was still there. He couldn't ignore it. Couldn't, however hard he tried. The melting hadn't gone far enough. Perhaps if he had been sitting between Fifi and Joanna. For the third time, that the loving cup went round. I drink to the imminence of his coming, said Morgana Rothschild, whose turn it happened to be to initiate the circular ride. Her tone was loud, exultant. She drank and passed the cup to Bernard. I drink to the imminence of his coming, he repeated, with a sincere attempt to feel that the coming was imminent, but the eyebrow continued to haunt him, and the coming, so far as he was concerned, was horribly remote. He drank and handed the cup to Clara de Turding. It'll be a failure again, he said to himself. I know it will. But he went on doing his best to beam. The loving cup had made its circuit. Lifting his hand, the president gave a signal. The chorus broke out into the third solidarity hymn. Feel how the greater being comes, rejoice and, in rejoicings, die, melt in the music of the drums, for I am you and you are I. As verse succeeded verse, the voices shrilled with an ever-intense excitement. The sense of the coming's imminence was like an electric tension in the air. 
The president switched off the music and, with the final note of the final stanza, there was absolute silence. The silence of stretched expectancy, quivering and creeping of a galvanic life. The president reached out his hand, and suddenly a voice, a deep strong voice, more musical than any merely human voice, richer, warmer, more vibrant with love and yearning and compassion, a wonderful, mysterious, supernatural voice spoke from above their heads. Very slowly, Oh, Ford, 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 it said, diminishingly and on a descending scale. A sensation of warmth radiated thrillingly out from the solar plexus to every extremity of the bodies of those who listened. Tears came into their eyes, their hearts, their bowels seemed to move within them as though of an independent life. Ford, they were melting. Ford, dissolved, dissolved. Then, in another tone, suddenly, startlingly, Listen, trumpeted the voice. Listen, they listened. After a pause sunk to a whisper, but a whisper somehow more penetrating than the loudest cry. The feet of the greater being, it went on and repeated the words. The feet of the greater being, the whisper almost expired. The feet of the greater being are on the stairs. Once more there was silence, and the expectancy, momentarily relaxed, was stretched again, torter, torter, almost to the tearing point. The feet of the greater being, oh, they heard them, they heard them, coming softly down the stairs, coming nearer and nearer down the invisible stairs, the feet of the greater being, and suddenly the tearing point was reached, her eyes staring, her lips parted, Morgana Rothschild sprang to her feet. I hear him, she cried, I hear him. He's coming, shouted Sarajini Engels. Yes, he's coming, I hear him, Fifi Bradlaugh and Tom Karaguchi rose simultaneously to their feet. Oh, 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 Joanna inarticulately testified. He's coming, yelled Jim Bokanovsky. The president leaned forward and, with a touch, released a delirium of cymbals and blown brass, a fever of tom-tomming. Oh, he's coming, screamed Clara deterting. Aye, and it was as though she were having her throat cut. Feeling that it was time for him to do something, Bernard also jumped and shouted. I hear him, he's coming. But it wasn't true. He heard nothing and, for him, nobody was coming. Nobody in spite of the music, in spite of the mounting excitement. But he waved his arms, he shouted with the best of them, and when the others began to jig and stamp and shuffle, he also jigged and shuffled. Round they went, a circular procession of dancers, each with hands on the hips of the dancer proceeding, round and round, shouting in unison, stamping to the rhythm of the music with their feet, beating it, beating it out with their hands on the buttocks in front, twelve pairs of hands beating as one, as one, twelve buttocks slabbily resounding, twelve as one, twelve as one, I hear him, I hear him coming, the music quickened, faster beat the feet, Faster, faster fell their rhythmic hands, and all at once a great synthetic bass boomed out the words which announced the approaching atonement and final consummation of solidarity, the coming of the twelve in one, the incarnation of the greater being. Orgy porgy, it sang, while the tom-toms continued to beat their feverish tattoo. Orgy porgy, forward and fun, kiss the girls and make them one, boys at one with girls at peace, orgy porgy gives release. Orgy porgy, the dancers caught up the liturgical refrain. Orgy porgy, forward and fun, kiss the girls. And as they sang, the lights began slowly to fade, to fade, and at the same time to grow warmer, richer, redder, until at last they were dancing in the crimson twilight of an embryo store. Orgy porgy. In their blood-coloured and fetal darkness, the dancers continued for a while to circulate, to beat and beat out the indefatigable rhythm. Orgy porgy. Then the circle wavered, broke, fell in partial disintegration on the ring of couches which surrounded, circle enclosing circle, the table and its planetary chairs. Orgy porgy. Tenderly the deep voice crooned and cooed. In the red twilight it was as though some enormous negro dove were hovering benevolently over the now prone or supine dancers. They were standing on the roof. Big Henry had just sung eleven. The night was calm and warm. Wasn't it wonderful? said Fifi Bradlaugh. Wasn't it simply wonderful? She looked at Bernard with an expression of rapture, but of rapture in which there was no trace of agitation or excitement, for to be excited is still to be unsatisfied. Hers was the calm ecstasy of achieved consummation, the peace, not of mere vacant satiety and nothingness, but of balanced life, of energies at rest and in equilibrium, a rich and living peace, for the solidarity service had given as well as taken, drawn off only to replenish. She was full, she was made perfect, she was still more than merely herself. Didn't you think it was wonderful? she insisted, looking into Bernard's face with those supernaturally shining eyes. Yes, I thought it was wonderful. He lied and looked away. The sight of her transfigured face was at once an accusation and an ironical reminder of his own separateness. He was as miserably isolated now as he had been when the service began. 
or isolated by reason of his unreplenished emptiness, his dead satiety, separate and unatoned, while the others are being fused into the greater being, alone even in Morgana's embrace, much more alone, indeed, more hopelessly himself than he had ever been in his life before. He had emerged from, his, from that crimson twilight into the common electric glare of a self-consciousness intensified to the pitch of agony. He was utterly miserable, and perhaps her shining eyes accused him. Perhaps it was his own fault. Quite wonderful, he repeated, but the only thing he could think of was Morgana's eyebrow. Chapter 6 Odd, 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 was Lenina's verdict on Bernard Marx. So odd, indeed, that in the course of the succeeding weeks she had wondered more than once whether she shouldn't change her mind about the New Mexico holiday and go instead to the North Pole with Benito Hoover. The trouble was that she knew the North Pole, had been there with George Edsel only last summer, and what was more, found it pretty grim. Nothing to do in the hotel too hopelessly old-fashioned, no television laid on in the bedrooms, no scent organ, only the most putrid synthetic music, and not more than 25 escalator squash courts for over 200 guests. No, decidedly she couldn't face the North Pole again. Added to which, she had only been to America once before, and even then, how inadequately, a cheap weekend in New York, had it been with Jean-Jacques Habibullah or Bokonovsky Jones. She couldn't remember. Anyhow, it was of absolutely no importance. The prospect of flying west again, and for a whole week, was very inviting. Moreover, for at least three days of that week they would be in the Savage Reservation. No more than half a dozen people in the whole centre had ever been inside a Savage Reservation. As an Alpha Plus psychologist, Bernard was one of the few men she knew entitled to a permit. For Lenina, the opportunity was unique. And yet, so unique also was Bernard's oddness that she had hesitated to take it, had actually thought of risking the polar game of funny old Benito. At least Benito was normal. Whereas Bernard... Alcohol in his blood surrogate was Fanny's explanation of every eccentricity. But Henry, with whom, one evening when they were in bed together, Lenina had rather anxiously discussed her new lover, Henry had compared poor Bernard to a rhinoceros. You can't teach a rhinoceros tricks, he had explained in his brief and vigorous style. Some men are almost rhinoceroses. They don't respond properly to conditioning. Poor devils. Bernard's one of them. Luckily for him, he's pretty good at his job. Otherwise, the director would never have kept him. However, he added consolingly, I think he's pretty harmless. Pretty harmless, perhaps, but also pretty disquieting. That mania to start with for doing things in private, which meant, in practice, not doing anything at all. For what was there one could do in private, apart from, of course, going to bed, but one couldn't do that all the time. Yes, what was there? Precious little. The first afternoon they went out together was particularly fine. Lenina had suggested a swim at Tokay Country Club, followed by a dinner at the Oxford Union. But Bernard thought there would be too much of a crowd. Then what about a round of electromagnetic golf at St Andrews? But again, no. Bernard considered that electromagnetic golf was a waste of time. Then what's time for? asked Lenina in some astonishment. Apparently for going on walks in the Lake District, for that was what he now proposed. Land on the top of Skidor and walk for a couple of hours in the heather. Alone with you, Lenina. But Bernard, we shall be alone all night. Bernard blushed and looked away. I meant alone for talking, he mumbled. Talking? But what about? Walking and talking, that seemed a very odd way of spending an afternoon. In the end she persuaded him, much against his will, to fly over to Amsterdam to see the semi-demi finals of the Women's Heavyweight Wrestling Championship. In a crowd, he grumbled, as usual. He remained obstinately gloomy the whole afternoon. He wouldn't talk to Lenina's friends, of whom they met dozens in the ice cream soma bar between the wrestling bouts, and in spite of his misery absolutely refused to take the half-gram raspberry sundae which she pressed upon him. I'd rather be myself, he said. Myself and nasty, not somebody else, however jolly. A gram in time saves nine, said Lenina, producing a bright treasure of sleep-taught wisdom. Bernard pushed away the proffered glass impatiently. Now, don't lose your temper, she said. Remember one cubic centimetre cures ten gloomy sentiments. Oh, for Ford's sake, be quiet, he shouted. Lenina shrugged her shoulders. A gram is always better than a dam, she concluded with dignity, and drank the sundae herself. On their way back across the channel, Bernard insisted on stopping his propeller and hovering on his helicopter screws within a hundred feet of the waves. The weather had taken a change for the worse. A southwesterly wind had sprung up. The sky was cloudy. Look, he commanded. But it's horrible, said Lenina, shrinking back from the window. She was appalled by the rushing emptiness of the night, by the black foam-flecked water having beneath them, by the pale face of the moon, so haggard and distracted among the hastening clouds. Let's turn on the radio. Quick! She reached for the dialing knob on the dashboard and turned it at random. 
Skies are blue inside of you, saying 16 tremoloing falsettos. The weather's always... Then a hiccough and a silence. Bernard had switched off the current. I want to look at the sea in peace, he said. One can't even look with that beastly noise going on. But it's lovely, and I don't want to look. But I do, he insisted. Makes me feel as though... He hesitated, searching for words with which to express himself. As though I were more me, if you see what I mean. More on my own, not so completely a part of something else. Not just a cell in the social body. Doesn't it make you feel like that, Lenina? But Lenina was crying. It's horrible. It's horrible, she kept repeating. Now can you talk like that about not wanting to be a part of the social body? After all, everyone works for everyone else. We can't do without anyone. Even Epsilons. Yes, I know, said Bernard derisively. Even Epsilons are useful. So am I, and I damned well wish I weren't. Lenina was shocked by his blasphemy. Bernard, she protested in a voice of amazed distress. How can you? In a different key. How can I? He repeated meditatively. No, the real problem is, how is it that I can't, or rather, because after all I know quite well why I can't, what would it be like if I could, if I were free, not enslaved by my conditioning? But Bernard, you're saying the most awful things. Don't you wish you were free, Lenina? I don't know what you mean. I am free. Free to have the most wonderful time. Everybody's happy nowadays. He laughed. Yes, everybody's happy nowadays. We begin giving the children that at five. Wouldn't you like to be free to be happy in some other way, Lenina? In your own way, for example, not in everybody else's way? I don't know what you mean, she repeated. Then, turning to him, Oh, do let's go back, Bernard, she besought. I do so hate it here. Don't you like being with me? But of course, Bernard. It's this horrible place. I thought we'd be more, more together here, with nothing but the sea and moon. More together than in that crowd, or even in my rooms. Don't you understand that? I don't understand anything, she said with de decision, determined to preserve her incomprehension intact. Nothing. Least of all, she continued in another tone, why don't you take some soma when you have these dreadful ideas of yours? You'd forget all about them, and instead of feeling miserable, you'd be jolly. So jolly. She repeated and smiled, with all the puzzled anxiety in her eyes, with what was meant to be an inviting and voluptuous cajolary. He looked at her in silence, his face unresponsive and very grave, looked at her intently. After a few seconds, Lenina's eyes flinched away. She uttered a nervous little laugh, tried to think of something to say, and couldn't. The silence prolonged itself. When Bernard spoke at last, it was in a small, tired voice. All right, then, he said. We'll go back. And stepping hard on the accelerator, he sent the machine rocketing up into the sky. At 4,000, he started his propeller. They flew in silence for a minute or two. Then, suddenly, Bernard began to laugh. Rather oddly, Lenina thought, but still, it was laughter. Feeling better? She ventured to ask. For answer, he lifted one hand from the controls and, slipping his arm around her, began to fondle her breasts. Thank Ford, she said to herself. He's all right again. Half an hour later, they were back in his rooms. Bernard swallowed four tablets of Soma at a gulp, turned on the radio and television and began to undress. Well, Lenina inquired, with significant archness when they, when they met the next afternoon on the roof. Did you think it was fun yesterday? Bernard nodded. They climbed into the plane, a little jolt, and they were off. Everyone says I'm awfully pneumatic, said Lenina reflectively, panting, patting her own legs. Awfully. There was an expression of pain in Bernard's eyes. Like meat, he was thinking. She looked up with a certain anxiety. But you don't think I'm too plump, do you? He shook his head. Like so much meat. You think I'm all right? Another nod. In every way? Perfect, he said aloud. And inwardly, she thinks of herself that way. She doesn't mind being meat. Lenina smiled triumphantly, but her satisfaction was premature. All the same, he went on after a little pause, I still rather wish it had all ended differently. Differently? Were there other endings? I didn't want it to end without going to bed, he specified. Lenina was astonished. Not at once, not the first day. But then what? He began to talk a lot of incomprehensible and dangerous nonsense. Lenina did her best to stop the ears of her mind, but every now and then a phrase would insist on becoming audible. To try the effect of arresting my impulses, she heard him say. The words seemed to touch a spring in her mind. Never put off till tomorrow the fun you can have today, she said gravely. Two hundred repetitions, twice a week from fourteen to sixteen and a half, was all his comment. The mad bad talk rambled on. I want to know what passion is, she heard him saying. I want to feel something strongly. When the individual feels, the community reels, Lenina pronounced. Well, why shouldn't it reel a bit? Bernard! But Bernard remained unabashed. 
Adults intellectually enduring working hours, he went on. Infants where feeling and desire are concerned. Our Ford loved infants, ignoring the interruption. It suddenly struck me the other day, continued Bernard, that it might be possible to be an adult all the time. I don't understand, Lenina's tone was firm. I know you don't, and that's why we went to bed together yesterday, like infants, instead of being adults and waiting. But it was fun, Lenina insisted. Wasn't it? Oh, the greatest fun, he answered, but in a voice so mournful, with an expression so profoundly miserable, that Lenina felt all her triumph suddenly evaporate. Perhaps he had, found her, he had found her too plump after all. I told you so, was all that Fanny said, when Lenina came and made her confidences. It's the alcohol they put in his surrogate. All the same, Lenina insisted. I do like him. He has such awfully nice hands. And the way he moves his shoulders. That's very attractive, she sighed. But I wish he weren't so odd. Halting for a moment outside the door of the director's room, Bernard drew a deep breath and squared his shoulders, bracing himself to meet the dislike and disapproval which he was certain of finding within. He knocked and entered. A permit for you to initial, director, he said as airily as possible, and laid the paper on the writing table. The director glanced at him sourly, but the stamp of the World Controller's office was at the head of the paper and the signature of Mustafa Mond, old and black, across the bottom. Everything was perfectly in order. The director had no choice. He penciled his initials, two small pale letters abject at the feet of Mustafa Mond, and was about to return the paper without a word of comment or genial Ford speed, when his eye was caught by something written in the body of the permit. For the New Mexican Reservation, he said, and his tone, the face he lifted to Bernard, expressed a kind of agitated astonishment. Surprised by his surprise, Bernard nodded. There was a silence. The director leaned back in his chair, frowning. How long ago was it? he said speaking more to himself than to Bernard. Twenty years, I suppose. Nearer twenty-five. I must have been your age. He sighed and shook his head. Bernard felt extremely uncomfortable. A man so conventional, so scrupulously correct as the director, and to commit so gross a solecism, it made him want to hide his face, to run out of the room. Not that he himself saw anything intrinsically objectionable in people talking about the remote past. That was one of those hypnopedic prejudices he had, so he imagined, completely got rid of. What made him feel shy was the knowledge that the director disapproved, disapproved and yet had been betrayed into doing the forbidden thing. Under what inward compulsion? Through his discomfort, Bernard eagerly listened. I had the same idea as you, the director was saying. Wanted to have a look at the savages. Got a permit for New Mexico and went there for my summer holiday. With the girl I was having at the moment. She was a beta minus and I think, he shut his eyes, I think she had yellow hair. Anyhow, she was pneumatic, particularly pneumatic. I remember that. Well, we went there and we looked at the savages and we rode about on horses and all that. And then, it was almost the last day of my leave. Then, well, she got lost. We'd gone up riding up one of those revolting mountains and it was horribly hot and oppressive. And after lunch, we went to sleep. Or at least I did. She must have gone for a walk, alone. At any rate, when I woke up, she wasn't there. And the most frightful thunderstorm I've ever seen was just bursting on us. And it poured and roared and flashed and the horses broke loose and ran away. And I fell down, trying to catch them, and hurt my knee so that I could hardly walk. Still I searched and I shouted and I searched. But there was no sign of her. Then I thought she must have gone back to the rest house by herself. So I crawled down into the valley by the way we had come. My knee was agonizingly painful, and I'd lost my soma. It took me hours. I didn't get back to the rest house till after midnight. And she wasn't there. She wasn't there, the director repeated. There was a silence. Well, he resumed at last. The next day there was a search, but we couldn't find her. She must have fallen into a gully somewhere or been eaten by a mountain lion. Ford knows. Anyhow, it was horrible. It upset me very much at the time. More than it ought to have done, I dare say. Because, after all, it's the sort of accident that might have happened to anyone. And, of course, the social body persists, although the component cells may change. But this sleep-taught consolation did not seem to be very effective. Shaking his head... I actually dream about it sometimes, the director went on in a low voice. Dream of being woken up by that peal of thunder amid fi and finding her gone. Dream of searching and searching for her and under the trees. He lapsed into the silence of reminiscence. You must have had a terrible shock, said Bernard, almost enviously. At the sound of his voice, the director started into a guilty realisation of where he was, shot a glance at Bernard, and averting his eyes, blushed darkly, looked at him again with sudden suspicion and angrily on his dignity. Don't imagine, he said but I'd had any in indecorous relation with the girl. Nothing emotional, nothing long drawn. It was all perfectly healthy and normal. He handed Bernard the permit. I really don't know why I bored you with this trivial anecdote. 
Furious with himself for having given away a discreditable secret, he vented his rage on Bernard. The look in his eyes was now frankly malignant. And I should like to take this opportunity, Mr. Marx, he went on, of saying that I'm not at all pleased with the reports I receive of your behaviour outside working hours. You must say that this is not my business. But it is. I have the good name of the centre to think of. My workers must be above suspicion, particularly those of the highest castes. Alphas are so conditioned that they do not have to be infantile in their emotional behaviour. But that is all the more reason for their making a special effort to conform. It is their duty to be infantile, even against their inclination. And so, Mr. Marx, I give you fair warning. The director's voice vibrated with an indignation that had now become wholly righteous and impersonal. Was the, was the expression of the disapproval of society itself. If ever I hear again of any lapse from a proper standard of infantile decorum, I shall ask for your transference to a sub-centre, preferably to Iceland. Good morning. And swivelling round in his chair, he picked up his pen and began to write. That'll teach him, he said to himself. But he was mistaken, for Bernard left the room for swagger, exulting, as he banged the door behind him, in the thought that he stood alone, and battled against the order of things, elated by the intoxicating consciousness of his individual significance and importance. Even the thought of persecution left him undismayed, was rather tonic than depressing. He felt strong enough to meet and overcome affliction, strong enough to face even Iceland, and this confidence was the greater for his not a moment really believing that he would be called upon to face anything at all. People simply weren't transferred for things like that. Iceland was just a fret, a most stimulating and life-giving fret. Walking along the corridor, he actually whistled. Heroic was the account he gave that evening of his interview with the DHC, whereupon, it concluded, I simply told him to go to the bottomless past and marched out of the room, and that was that looked at Helmholtz Watson expectantly, awaiting his due reward of sympathy, encouragement, admiration. But no word came. Helmholtz sat silent, staring at the floor. He liked Bernard. He was grateful to him for being the only man of his acquaintance with whom he could talk about the subjects he felt to be important. Nevertheless, there were things in Bernard which he hated. This boasting, for example, and the outbursts of an abject self-pity with which it alienated and his deplorable habit of being bold after the event, and full, in absence, of the most extraordinary presence of mind. He hated these things, just because he liked Bernard. The seconds passed. Helmholtz continued to stare at the floor, and suddenly Bernard blushed and turned away. The journey was quite uneventful. The Blue Pacific rocket was two and a half minutes early at New Orleans, lost four minutes in a tornado over Texas, but flew into a favourable air current at longitude 95 west and was able to land at Santa Fe less than 40 seconds behind schedule time. 40 seconds on a six and a half hour flight. Not so bad, Lenina conceded. They slept that night at Santa Fe. The hotel was excellent, incomparably better, for example, than that horrible Aurora Bora Palace in which Lenina had suffered so much the previous summer. Liquid air, television, vibrovacuum massage, radio, boiling caffeine solution, hot contraceptives, and eight different kinds of scent were laid on in every bedroom. The synthetic music plant was working as they entered the hall and left nothing to be desired. A notice in the lift announced that there were 60 escalator squash racket courts in the hotel, that obstacle and electromagnetic golf could both be played in the park. But it sounds simply too lovely, cried Lenina. I almost wish we could stay here. 60 escalator squash courts. There won't be any in the reservation, Bernard warned her, and no scent, no television, no hot water even. If you feel you can't stand it, stay here till I come back. Lenina was quite offended. Of course I can stand it. I only said it was lovely here because, well, because progress is lovely, isn't it? 500 repetitions once a week from 13 to 17, said Bernard wearily, as though to himself. What did you say? I said that progress was lovely. That's why you mustn't come to the reservation unless you really want to. But I do want to. Very well then, said Bernard and it was almost a fret. Their permit required the signature of the warden of the reservation, at whose office next morning they duly presented themselves. An Epsilon Plus Negro porter took in Bernard's card, and they were almost and they were admitted almost immediately. The warden was a blonde and brachiophallic alpha minus, short, red moon-faced and broad-shouldered with a loud booming voice, very well adapted to the utterance of hypnopedic wisdom. He was a mine of irrelevant information and unasked for good advice. At once started, he went on and on, boomingly. 560,000 square kilometres divided into four distinct sub-reservations, each surrounded by a high-tension wire fence. At this moment, and for no apparent reason, Bernard suddenly remembered that he had left the Eau de Cologne tap in his bathroom wide open and running, supplied with current from the Grand Canyon Hydroelectric Station. It cost me a fortune by the time I get back. With his mind's eye, Bernard saw the needle on the Saint meter creeping round and round, ant-like, indefatigable. Quickly, telephone to Helmholtz Watson. 
upwards of 5,000 kilometers of fencing at 60,000 volts. You don't say so, said Lenina politely, not knowing in the least what the warden had said, but taking her cue from his dramatic pause. When the warden started booming, she had inconspicuously swallowed half a gram of soma, with the result that she could now sit, serenely not listening, thinking of nothing at all, but with her large blue eyes fixed on the warden's face in an expression of rapt attention. To touch the fence is instant death, pronounced the warden solemnly. There is no escape from a savage reservation. The word escape was suggestive. Perhaps, said Bernard, half rising, we ought to think of going. The little black needle was scurrying, an insect, nibbling through time, eating into his money. No escape, repeated the warden, waving him back into his chair, and as the permit was not yet countersigned. Bernard had no choice but to obey. Those who are born in the reservation, and remember, my dear young lady, he added, leering obscenely at Lenina and speaking in an improper whisper, remember that, in the reservation, children still are born, yes, actually born, revolting as that may seem. He hoped that this reference to his shameful subject would make Lenina blush, but she only smiled with simulated intelligence and said, you don't say so. Disappointed, the warden began again. Those, I repeat, who are born in the reservation are destined to die there. Destined to die. A decaliter of eau de cologne every minute. Six liters an hour. Perhaps, Bernard tried again, we ought. Leaning forward, the warden tapped the table with his forefinger. You ask me how many people live in the reservation. And I reply, triumphantly, I reply that we do not know. We can only guess. You don't say so. My dear young lady, I do say so. Six times twenty-four. No, it would be nearer six times thirty-six. Bernard was pale and trembling with impatience, but inexorably the booming continued. About sixty thousand Indians and half-breeds, absolute savages, our inspectors occasionally visit, otherwise no communication whatever with the civilized world, still preserve their repulsive habits and customs. Marriage, if you know what that is, my dear young lady, families, no conditioning, monstrous superstitions, Christianity and totemism and ancestor worship, Extinct, lang extinct languages such as Zuni and Spanish and Afapascan, humors, porcupines, and other ferocious animals, infectious diseases, priests, venomous lizards. You don't say so. They got away at last. Bernard dashed to the telephone. Quick, quick, but it took him nearly three minutes to get on to Helmholtz Watson. We might be among the savages already, he complained. Damned incompetence. Have a gram, suggested Lenina. He refused, preferring his anger. And at last, thank Ford, he was through, and yes, it was Helmholtz. Helmholtz, to whom he explained what had happened, and who promised to go round at once, at once, and turn off the tap, yes, at once, but took this opportunity to tell him what the DHC had said in public yesterday evening. What? He's looking out for someone to take my place? Nod's voice was agonized. So it's actually decided? Did he mention Iceland? You say he did? Ford! Iceland. He hung up at the receiver and turned back to Lenina. His face was pale, his expression utterly dejected. What's the matter? she asked. The matter? He dropped heavily into a chair. I'm going to be sent to Iceland. Often in the past he had wondered what it would be like to be subjected, so malice and with nothing but his own inward resources to rely on, some great trial, some pain, some persecution. He had even longed for affliction. As recently as a week ago in the director's office, he had imagined himself courageously resisting, stoically accepting suffering without a word. The director's threats had actually elated him, made him feel larger than life. But that, as he now realized, was because he had not taken the threats quite seriously. He had not believed that, when it came to the point, the DHC would ever do anything. Now that it looked as though the threats were really to be fulfilled, Bernard was appalled. Of that imagined stoicism, that theoretical courage, not a trace was left. He raged against himself. What a fool! Against the director. How unfair not to give him that other chance, that other chance which he now had no doubt at all he had always intended to take. And Iceland. Iceland. Lenina shook her head. Was and will make me ill, she quoted. I take a gram and only am. In the end, she persuaded him to swallow four tablets of soma. Four, five minutes later, roots and fruits were abolished. The flower of the present ros rosily blossomed. A message from the porter announced that, at the warden's orders, a reservation guard had come round to the plane and was waiting on the roof of the hotel. They went up at once. An octoroon in gamma green uniform saluted them and proceeded to recite the morning's program. A bird's eye view of, a, of ten or a dozen of the principal pueblos then a landing for lunch in the valley of Malpais. The rest house was comfortable there, and up at the Pueblo the savages would probably be celebrating their summer festival. It would be the best place to spend the night. They took their seats in the plane and set off. Ten minutes later they were crossing the frontier that separated civilization from savagery. 
uphill and down across the deserts of salt or sand, through forests, into the violet depth of canyons, over crag and peak and table-topped mesa, the fence marched on and on, irresistibly the straight line, the geometrical symbol of triumphant human purpose. And that its foot, here and there, a mosaic of white bones, a still unrotted carcass, dark on the towny ground, marked the place where deer or steer, puma or porcupine or coyote, or the greedy turkey buzzards drawn down by the roof of carrion and fulminated as though by a poetic justice, had come too close to the destroying wires. They never learn, said the green uniformed pilot, pointing down at the skeletons on the ground below them, and they never will learn, he added and laughed, as though he had somehow scored a personal triumph over the electrocuted animals. Bernard also laughed, after two grams of soma, the joke seemed, for some reason, good. Laughed and then almost immediately dropped off to sleep, and sleeping was carried over Taos and Tesk, over Namb and Picarus and Pojak, over Sia and Kochiti, over Laguna and Akoma and the Enchanted Mesa, over Zuni and Cibola and Oj Caliente, and, wo and woke at last to find the machine standing on the ground. Lenina was carrying the suitcases into a small square house in the Gamma Green Octoroon, talking incomprehensibly of a young Indian. Mile pies, explained the pilot as Bernard stepped out. This is the rest house, and there's a dance this afternoon at the Puebla. He'll take you there. He pointed over to the, he pointed to the sullen young savage. Funny, I expect, he grinned. Everything they do is funny. And with that, he climbed into the plane and started up the engines. Back tomorrow, and remember, he added reassuringly to, reassuringly to Lenina, they're perfectly tame. Savages won't do you any harm. They've got enough experience of gas bombs to know that they mustn't play any tricks. Still laughing, they threw the helicopter screws into gear, accelerated, and was gone.